it's all powered up. And if luck be with us, we'll get through it. There are, I've got, you know, what we're doing here is trying to assess the collection, find out what's really important, what the specimens are, track them, and bring it into order. And um, it's not an easy chore. Most of the time, it's somebody sitting here looking at books. It's real quiet, kind of boring stuff. But we've had people here that kind of bring a little bit of life to it. Now, Dixie Ruggles was one. Now, most of her work's got done. She doesn't show up too much now. But I, so I've got some video clips of us doing things. Some of it's kind of quiet. And some of it, she just tells you what she thinks. Uh, and when I said 20 years of treasure hunting, well, it was actually 22. But I went, so let's just, uh, we can lower the lights a little bit, maybe. And uh, the big question has been, in most a lot of the institutions in Indiana, what's, what is in the collection at the working men's? I mean, did it contain any of these original type specimen? A type specimen is the is a specimen that is scientifically described, and it's the standard for that species. So uh, forever, uh, people were describing type specimens and putting them in museums. Were any of those here? Uh, Coletosaurus, this is a footprint, a fossil from northern Indiana. It was described by E.T. Cox, and it's missing. So everybody says, well, maybe it's down at the Working Men's Institute. Maybe it's in the State Museum. Well, we got the State Museum. We've did everything we need to do. It's not there. It's not here either. And then we see, like the fossil, I mean, excuse me, the muscle case that was in the, the middle museum room there for many, many years. And the labels on these things said, uh, gave the scientific name followed by the name Say, and, um, and a little bit of information on it. And everybody seemed to think, well, maybe these were actually uh, identified by Say, or these are part of Say's collection. And these are all the questions we, we kind of ask going in. What is here? What's important? And what happened first, Indiana University was the first to get there. And you really can't read this, but that's, they'd made a, a catalog of what they found. They got uh, into the museum. They worked for three days, got through 66 boxes. And they made an inventory. Most of these people are not around anymore. John Patton, I mean, everybody likes John Patton. Alan Horowitz, who's all Indiana University geologist. I mean, he knew paleontology in Indiana. Uh, Rex Rhodes is still with us. And, uh, oh my gosh, who was the other? I can't read it. But, uh, and one of the other, one other geologist. Uh, but they did uh, the first assessment on this. And uh, they gave us a printout of this. And we said, wait, we, we might be interested in doing some work at the working men's. And so Bill McKnight and I got in in 1990, and we did our summary uh, of what we found in the rest of the boxes and the rest of the museum. And it was just kind of a quick overview. You know, here's about 300 mussels. Here's 500 aquatic snails. There's, you know, archaeological, you know, pestles and mortars and chip and chert and, and ceramics and things like that. Uh, so we made sort of an assessment. And then we decided, we, let's try to go on and, and take this thing on, if they wanted us to, and they did, to try to see what's going on in the collection. So I began to enlist people, and it was really a lot of Randy Patrick's, uh, where he worked at South Mount High School, the, the staff there, and volunteers. And I got some biologists around, and we began really coming in on our collection trips in uh, probably about 1992. We did, on our first on our big survey, we, we sort of estimated there's about 100,000 individual items in the natural history and archaeology collection. And we broke them down into groups. I mean, plants was a couple hundred, but snails, there are 30,000 snails probably in there. We had, uh, now we estimated there was 11,400 mussels. Later, we found our estimate was off. We actually found that there was only about 10,000. So we were pretty close on that estimate. Uh, and uh, the marine invertebrates, I said, Randy, take these over. All these marine things that you find in the oceans today, a lot of them were brought to the collection by E.T. Cox and people that bought some of his, his estate. Uh, there's 13,000 of those. But fossils, we have fossils from all over Indiana, some from New Harmony Cutoff, and elsewhere, there's about 15,000 estimate, estimated. So now the idea is to 
bring these into sort of a museum standard. The problem is to look at this collection, which is in chaos, and to bring it into order. And uh, I mean, I saw that out in New Harmony here, and I said, my, look, all the coarse stuff is with the coarse, the greens with the green, the squares with the squares, all the textures and all that. And I said, this is really orderly. And that's what we're attempting to do with the collection, to understand what it is. Uh, but it's not always easy because they're hard to identify. Like you may at first say, what the heck is that? And that's prominent in New Harmony, at least it was a couple years ago. That's the bridge at night. And I had a time exposure. You can see a red light coming from the right. That's the tail light of a car, reflection of the bridge into the water. But the same way, it's difficult to recognize all these fossils. I mean, because there are thousands of fossils, rocks, minerals, bones, all this. And so you've got to find experts. We found a lot of good experts with muscles. We got some of the best. We've still got to bring different experts for a lot of different groups. So we're in the midst of doing all this. And processing the collection. The general thing is that everything gets clean, and everything did get clean. We're done with that. Everything gets a catalog number. We're almost through there. Get expert identifications in part. We record everything in a database. We've got 27,000 records. Um, and get safe environmentally controlled storage, and we have that. And uh, it wasn't like that years ago when it was up in the attic. And I think that was the attic of the past, for those of you who remember that. And there's actually two photos here. But at different times, it, it had been re-roofed here. There was pigeon manure, there was mouse manure, there was recluse spiders everywhere at the time, uh, just soot and grime. And uh, everything was on the floor. This was actually in 1996. And we brought all those, those uh, the shelves upstairs piece by piece and built them up there. But that's sort of where it was back in those days. And there were still fun things. I mean, a rattlesnake there, you know, and, and uh, all this. But all this is now dealt with, and it's not there. It's, uh, let's look at the early days in the attic. See, I've got to get this to trigger. This is, this is in, in probably the year 2000. And we've got muscles done up there. Now, you see this on exhibit now, but back then, he had been disemboweled. All the sawdust fell out. He seemed kind of happy, though, to see us. And again, this is years later. Everything is off the floor. It was not off the floor when we began. Yeah, yes, it was. Uh, during the day, as you can guess, it was 90-some. And the liquid preserve collection. Heaven knows from Dr. Morrow's... Blah, blah, blah. I'm shooting a night shot then, and so you can just do an eerie run through. That's what Randy Patrick has to deal with. I remember we have thousands of these. They've all got to be cleaned, uh, identified, numbers assigned. The newspapers that were packing these were 1860, 1870, 1880. And uh, they were rotten. We recorded. We couldn't, not too much. At first we tried, but then we said, hey, it's dust. But this doesn't exist anymore. This is all out of the attic. And it's in great climate controlled space. More rocks and minerals, and we've got botanicals. We still have a lot left in the drawers. Okay, this place is spooky at night, I can tell you. It does get spooky at night, I tell you. Now, 
when we first began this, we, we weren't sure how to do the cataloging because we knew that any time we move something, it would lose the context where it was found in. And things in a similar box might really have been packed there because they were from like Cox Collection or Samson Collection. So Bill Wepler, archaeologist, said, you need to do this like an archaeological dig. And he said, you assign a number to every unit. So we got a real specific number for every individual drawer, for every box, anything was packaged together, got a number. Once these things, the, the uh, specimens got the numbers tracking, then we could disperse them, put them together, and, and compare and identify. But on paper, we can get everything back to the original boxes where they came from. So that was, it was pretty important to get that plan. Freshwater muscle, muscle collection is one of the first we went after because mussels were easy to clean, they're fun to clean, they have a lot of color, and you can write a number on it. And we, we began on that stuff. There are a lot of, of rare things in the collection, uh, some that are extinct. Oh, It's going to work then. And we printed out 10,000 labels and tried to get them matched with stuff, and that was a monster. I don't know. We may do it again, but these gals that work with Randy, and there's Dixie. Uh, so we laid them all out at once. These, oh, these have two different numbers, but they're, they're actually a pair. So we put them together like this, and we put same shell, two numbers. OK, let me, uh, let me grab it over there. Because the two different valves are in different boxes sometimes. This way you know what boxes went together. These are all extinct. These are right out of the Wabash River. The males and females look different. Uh, it's hard to believe that clams have different sexes, but, but there's the female. And uh, most institutions have none. You've got 50 pair here. That is rare stuff. I caught her off guard here. Talk about kids. <laughs> she did not like my camera. And <laughs> she, was, she was totally embarrassed. Totally embarrassed. And all these are paired valves. They've got numbers on them, and we're waiting to, we laid everything out. 20,000 valves in the basement down here laid out all at once. It was a nightmare. We had some 18 hour days near the end because we had to get it done. This is just a little bit of a walkthrough. They're in the archive storage in, 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 in downstairs. I mean, in the archives, yes. So everything. This is David Stansberry. He's probably one of the best muscle experts in the country. And it wasn't hard to talk him into coming out here. And so we're talking muscle business, you know. Like how you identify certain species. It's very good. Usually, the, uh, first of all, the beeps, instead of being turned forward, such as this, this one. The beeps come up at each other. They're opposed. Okay. Very little of this protein material. Plus, this posterior ridge swings out and down. Yeah. And it's instead of being. But when all these muscle people come together, it's, it's the time they get to work with the real master. And like, all right. And uh, because we have a lot of collection here to lay out. That's Brant Fish. He's our, the muscle guy for Indiana, the DNR muscle guy. <laughs> this muscle, one of the big characteristics, it has big ridges on it. But this is one out of all the thousands that had none. And it's like, it's just a fluke. You know, and you have to know everything else to, to be able to recognize that. Oh, I just hit my head on that low. <laughs> Anyone's walked in the basement, there's that low beam. I just did it. 